Today I'm going to speak about how we manage our Kubernetes clusters. We'll talk about cluster architecture, what components we're using, and what future enhancements we're planning to implement in our Kubernetes infrastructures. We started to look into Kubernetes in 2019. We went a long way uh, from um, manual cluster deployments in single data center to automated management solution based on KubeSpray. It's a set of Ansible roles uh, to manage Kubernetes and GitOps toolkit uh, to manage cluster components and cluster applications. Uh, let's talk about our cluster layout a little bit and basic components we're using. So it's really nothing special and follows usual deployment models. We have uh, three VMware VMs for control plane nodes. Then we have three nodes for each CD and uh, then countless, countless worker nodes uh, to run the workloads. Uh, we don't uh, schedule our workloads on uh, control plane nodes and VC nodes so that if something happens to the workload, it doesn't kill our cluster or our HCD uh, deployments. You can notice that our worker nodes are not that powerful. Uh, this limitation comes from VMware. Uh, the automatic virtual machine rebalancing, I think it's called vMotion, doesn't work very well on bigger VMs. Uh, so that's why our worker nodes are just 16 CPU and 24 gigabytes of memory. Currently, we are looking into having uh, bare metal Kubernetes deployments to overcome this uh, compute power limitation. And basically just today, uh, my team uh, messaged me that uh, they were able to deploy a fully blown production ready Kubernetes cluster on bare metal. So this was really great news for us. As for the cluster components, uh, which are listed on the right side of the slide, uh, it's pretty standard. I'm not going to dive deep into too much details there. Uh, just mentioned that the reason why we're using two ingresses, HA proxy ingress controller and engine con ingress controller is for convenience only. Some of our developers requested us to enable engine ingress controllers in the clusters because they do some fancy rewriting for their application and they needed that functionality. Our default is HA proxy though. Uh, if you don't specify ingress class in your ingress definition, HA proxy ingress will be, uh, will be handling incoming HTTP and HTTPS requests to your workload. For persistent volume support, we use uh, deprecated in tree uh, driver from vSphere. The reason for that is because our VMware installation is a little bit old and it doesn't support the fancy new up-to-date CSI drivers. Uh, we're waiting for that to be fixed for us by another team. Uh, hopefully, eventually, we'll be able to switch to cloud storage interface. Other more interesting, I would say, components uh, we are using is GitOps Toolkit that I mentioned already, Sealed Secrets Controller uh, from Bitnami and Prometheus Operator. Sealed Secrets Controller allow us to store secret resources in Git. Uh, basically, the way it works is that encrypts a secret in special format. You can store it in Git and run kubectl sorry, apply against it. Uh, the sealed secret resource will be created in the cluster and sealed secrets controller will decrypt uh, sealed secret resource and create the secret resource for it. Uh, the Prometheus operator is used for cluster monitoring, nothing, nothing special there. And GitOps Toolkit is our bread and butter and we'll be talking about it in a little bit more details. This picture is small. Okay. Nevertheless, uh, GitOps Toolkit, also known as FluxQB, or simply Flux, is a set of controllers that uh, provide you an API to manage your cluster from a Git repository or from a number of Git repositories. There is no hard requirement to use just a single repository to manage your manifest. Uh, installing Flux in the cluster means, <coughs> excuse me, installing Flux in the cluster adds support for several custom resources, which define where your manifests, manifests are stored, uh, how to install your, your Helm charts, how to handle updates, and so on. Flux also allows you to automatically update your 
applications whenever there is a new image built by your CI and pushed to uh, your Docker registry. Uh, Flux is able to watch a Docker reg registry and automatically update an image that is running in the cluster. I don't think we'll have time to talk about this one today. We'll see. The very basic concept is that you create a Git repository which stores your manifests and description of Helm releases. Install Flux pointing to that repository into your cluster and bam, your stuff is working up and running after some time without uh, any manual intervention. And uh, what's the most important is that your cluster is always in the state which you define in Git. You can always be sure that it's uh, up to date, that no manual changes were made. If someone will make a manual changes to some resources in the cluster, Flux will notice it and will roll it back to the state that's in Git. Here are the main um, Flux controllers and uh, custom resources they provide. Uh, there are more into this, but these are really like the working horses of, uh, of GitOps toolkit. Source controller provides you a Git repository API. Uh, this API describes uh, the Git repository. It's URL, credentials, which branch to uh, watch and uh, how often the repository should be queried for the new changes. Uh, customize controller provides you customization API. This is different from the Kubernetes customized set of APIs. You just, they just use the same name for some weird reason, not sure. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, uh, customization API tells Flux where to find your manifests and how to apply them. Uh, within, uh, how to find your manifest within the Git repository. And uh, Helm controller provides support for Helm release API. Uh, this API describes your Helm release. If, uh, if you're far, far famil familiar with Helm, uh, it describes like where to find the Helm chart, which values to use, and so on and so forth. We also use Flux notification controller and image update automation controllers from Flux, but I won't be talking about those today because we only have limited time. Uh, before we talk a little bit more details about how all those APIs work and how they look like, uh, I want to show you our repository layout. We are using multi-tenant concept. In the repository, uh, there are several, uh, several subdirectories created which correspond to the name of the namespaces. Each application in our infrastructure gets uh, three namespaces, uh, which equals to three environments that the applications are uh, running in QA, dev, and node. The directories, like the naming convention is not enforced, uh, it's just our agreement that we'll name the directories uh, as namespaces name. The actual namespace definition is stored inside the YAML file that's stored in, in the directory. Uh, this is basically our usual repository. Uh, the system components, as we call them, it's like ingress controllers, Prometheus operators, everything that's not applications, basically. Each get uh, only one namespace, which is application name dash system. And uh, they only get just one namespace. We have, we have uh, separate staging cluster to test upgrades and uh, changes to the system components in the production clusters. We do have certain namespaces where engineers prefer to manage their manifest themselves from their own uh, repositories. And uh, the way it looks like is basically the namespace definition is still present in our repository, but we delegate the rest of the objects management uh, to another uh, team repository uh, using customizations and Git repository resource. This is how usual Git repository definition looks like. Uh, actually, any Git repository definition will look like 
like this. It's uh, very short and <laughs> up to the point. Uh, this definition basically tells uh, Flux source controller to fetch branch main from the very specific URL every minute. Flux doesn't care about what exactly is in the repository at this point. It will happily clone like kernel sources, for example, for you. Uh, so this is it. This is all that resource is doing. It just clones the repository or fetches updates from the remote repository. Then we have customization that I mentioned already a couple of times. Uh, this is connected with the uh, Git repository through the source ref uh, definition in the spec uh, dictionary. Uh, this guy already cares about what is the actual content. Uh, it will ignore non-YAML files. It will do nothing with them, so you can store like readmes or some pictures uh, describing the application uh, architecture in your namespace directories. But it will fail if it encounters poorly written YAML uh, or uh, poorly written in Kubernetes manifest. It performs certain validations before it actually tries to apply the changes. And uh, if the validation is not uh, passing, then it will fail. You can have any number of customizations watching different Git repositories for manifests uh, for you. In our setup, uh, it's just our organizational agreement that we always have a Git repository named Flux System, which is located in the Flux System namespace. And uh, anyone basically can create a merge request to our Flux System uh, Git repository. Uh, our team will review it, and if it's accepted, the objects will appear uh, in the corresponding cluster. Um, before I go to Helm release discussion uh, or description, I want to mention that we have, we currently have uh, six Kubernetes clusters and we have six Flux system repositories. So we don't uh, manage all our cluster from single Git repository. We use one repository per, per cluster just for management convenience or maintenance convenience rather. Until now, we saw how Flux handles plain manifests. Uh, let's talk about the Helm charts. There is a Helm controller in Flux uh, that, I, that I mentioned before, which provides you the Helm release API. Uh, you can see it on the screen. Uh, it's really nice and special. I'm not sure if it's visible uh, to everyone, but if you're familiar with uh, Helm command line tool, uh, you should pretty much figure out the format uh, of the manifest. Uh, there is one new resource that I didn't talk about uh, before. You can see it in the source ref uh, definition, uh, this kind Helm repository. It's another source controller uh, set of APIs that basically describe a Helm repository. It can be anything. It can be a Git repo containing your Helm charts, or it can be some upstream Helm.sh, uh, Helm library, I think it's called. Uh, so it's pretty flexible which sources you can, uh, you can have to define your, uh, to store your Helm charts. The Helm release uh, object, uh, or rather Helm controller, uh, using the Helm release definition, will check the state of the installed Helm, Helm release in cluster every hour and uh, run Helm upgrade command uh, against it. This comes with its like pluses and minuses uh, because <coughs> Helm upgrade not always working well, especially if you change some like sensitive values of the values. Uh, but uh, usually there is, uh, there is pretty, uh, it's usually pretty seamless, uh, this management. Uh, the values can be stored in the same file as the Helm release definition, as you can see on the screen, or you can refer some uh, remote values file that is stored somewhere in Git or uh, is available at some web URL, stuff like that. It's again, it's very, it's very flexible. Uh, we have limited time left, so I 
skip right to the known issues that we hit with this setup. Normally, you would expect that uh, uh, when you deploy, when you do a disaster recovery for a cluster, you spin up a bare, bare bones cluster, install Flux in it, point it to your uh, Flux repository and stuff should work. Well, yes and no. Uh, we recently found out that uh, we, and it's just our uh, infrastructure, you might have different situation. We have circular dependencies in our repositories. For example, Prometheus operator is using uh, sealed secrets resources and it provides service monitor resource. And sealed secrets controller is using service monitor resource and provides the sealed secrets uh, resources support. So this creates this circular dependency for us where uh, both of the controllers cannot be installed because the uh, Helm release uh, resource or object fails because it cannot create uh, stuff for you. We don't have a good solution for it yet. For now, we just uh, literally remove the uh, service monitor definition from the repository for seal sealed secret controller, uh, wait for stuff to be installed and uh, uh, return the service monitor definition back. Uh, we are using storage driver, which is deprecated for a long time now. Uh, this I mentioned already. Uh, and we have uh, some of the security issues with this setup uh, because Flux allows you to uh, use third party, well, third party, more than one Git repository to manage a single cluster. And we actually use this feature. We uh, provide, like, we manage certain resources. We all, our developers to manage uh, their workloads. Uh, there is a chance that uh, these resources, uh, these repositories can contain some malicious manifests, like someone wants to bump up their namespace limits or whatnot. And we have zero control over uh, those repositories. We don't participate in code reviews there and so on and so forth. Uh, solution for that is to enable, uh, or to disable actually, to disable uh, cross namespace references in Flux. Uh, it's pretty well documented in, in the Flux documentation. It's just we have certain workloads that actually need this functionality and we're right now we're trying to work this around in the nicest way possible. Uh, I'm going to wrap up according to my timer. We have one minute and a half left for the questions. Uh, the slide deck will be available from the organizers if you need it. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And if you have any questions, raise your hand right now or find me in the, during the party. I will be happy to talk about our cluster setup. Thank you. How do you manage uh, the infrastructure below Kubernetes? Well, as I said, it's uh, VMware virtual machines and VMware infrastructure is manag managed by separate team. Answering your question, we don't. <laughs> The configuration management, like we, uh, we do manage the OS layer uh, on the virtual machines. Uh, we use Puppet as our configuration management system, but it really doesn't uh, touch any Kubernetes related things. Maybe a couple of CCTLs, but uh, not more than that. How do you upgrade your clusters? How do we operate our clusters? Can you elaborate? Upgrade. Upgrade. Oh, yeah, this is a very good question. <coughs> so since we are using KubeSpray, we basically follow KubeSpray official documentation. And uh, the upgrade itself consists of a uh, couple of manual steps uh, that are like we upgrade the KubeSpray version that we're using. And we upgrade to the version of the Kubernetes cluster that comes with the version of the KubeSpray. We don't override it. Uh, in the in the group variables file, so uh, we uh, thank you and hold on, I want to finish. 
we don't uh, do anything fancy that goes beyond the official guide because we want uh, newcomers to onboard quickly so that it's enough for them to read the official documentation and be done with it. Uh, yeah, <coughs> uh, another question in regards to fabrics. So, which Qt version do you use? And uh, so, yeah, which uh, which Qt version do you use? And as far as I as, as I'm concerned, uh, the intrig virus would be disabled in a couple of Qt releases, and you will have a couple of problems with that, I guess. I don't. So the question was which uh, Kubernetes version we're using right now, and uh, what we're going to do when the driver will disappear, uh, the storage driver will disappear from the uh, from the Kubernetes version that we are about to upgrade to. I don't remember the exact version that we are using right now. It's what was latest in Kube's pre repository uh, two months ago. Yeah, two months ago we finished our quarterly upgrade cycles and uh, it's 1.29 something, I think. I'm not sure really. Uh, what we are going to do when the driver will be removed from the tree? Well, as I mentioned, the VMware, we hope that our VMware will be upgraded and we will be able to switch to uh, CSI, uh, CSI drivers, cloud storage interfaces. If we won't be able to do it, well, we'll just stay on the version, on the latest version where the driver is enabled because we cannot, we cannot upgrade without, uh, without having the persistence. We have certain stuff like Harbor, for example, that we use for uh, Docker images hosting. Uh, it requires persistence and we cannot, we cannot just upgrade and drop the persistence support from the clusters. 